Live from the Hilton at Bonnet Creek, Orlando, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Vision 2015. Brought to you by IBM. And now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Hi everybody, we're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. We're here at IBM Vision. Go to ibmvisiongo.com and check out all the social streams that we put together for this event. Mark Jeffries is here, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's hosting this event. I am. Mark, welcome to theCUBE. Not for quite on. now, right yeah. now they're, they're hostless in there. Yeah, you are the guest, we're hosting. <laughs> I know, I know, it's great. Uh, it's a pleasure good to, to take a break. Here. Pass the baton. I think so, it's important. So former stockbroker, you got yes, out of that gig. I did. Just in time, good call. Well, you know what, it was, I was there for five years. <laughs> And I remember thinking, because that was always my goal, I wanted to be in finance, I'm an economist, and I thought I want to get to the city, we call it in London, the city. And I get there, and I managed to kind of talk my way into my very first role, and I realized after a few years, I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it, I didn't like the people, I didn't like the hours. I'd be in the office at five in the morning, and it was just insane. I liked the money though, that was good. <laughs> but it wasn't everything, right? Money isn't everything, it's a lot, but it's not everything. So I just, I got out. So I left. now you're writing, speaking, yes. doing conferences well, like I, this? The, the journey was interesting because it went via television, a bit like this. So I, I always fancied being in TV and I managed to somehow, again, talk. This is my big thing, talking. I talked my way into a role at a TV station, a small cable channel in the UK, and then everything was a stepping stone. And I ended up with a live daily finance show on a channel called The Money Channel in the UK. And what was interesting was I would be interviewing executives and at the end of the interview we got a commercial break and they'd say to me, Mark, you're very good at this. Why don't you come and do this at our live event, which I'd never even considered before. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm on stage in front of real people, not just cameras and, and beautiful lights. And uh, it really picked up ahead of steam. So that became what is now my full career. Well, it's very enjoyable to watch you up on stage. You're a natural. Thank um, you. We're here, you know, now, it's interesting, we're here at a tech conference. Yes. Right? A lot of business technology. This is not like super geeky. No. We do a lot of conferences. This is sort of more you know, financial oriented, but uh, yes. do you do a lot of tech conferences? I do, and it's funny, I was having this discussion this morning. I'd say something in the region of 60, maybe even 63% of the conferences that I host and moderate, they're tech. So some pretty big tech names and some of the smaller ones as well. You know, I have no favorites. I love all my clients. But what's interesting is the more I do, when I, whether I'm with IBM or any other tech company, the more I do, the more I learn about the industry. So really without ever directing myself here, I found out so much about the business of IT and specifically about analytics and the technology around analytics that now people see me as one of the experts. I'm not, that's completely a lie. But I, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. So a lot of tech events, but I also do a lot in the pharmaceutical sector and uh, a lot in what we call professional services. So the EYs, Deloitte's, KPMG's, that group as well. So what do you see as the similarities and differences as you go across you know, industries and talk to different audiences. Uh, uh, what, what's the same and well, what's different? There's, there's two ways to look at this story. Okay, you're either the audience member or you're the, uh, you're the host, the speaker, you're the organization, you're the vendor. So let's think of it from the audience member first. You're an audience member, you come to an event like this, why do you come? Well, you want to learn something new. So you've got to make sure if you're putting on an event like this, there is content that I can use. Don't just give me a list of stuff. Give me something I can use. So. The organizers of these events have got to think, what's the language of my audience? What do they need? What are their pain points? What can we solve right now? And how can we grow our relationship with them? Now, the second big reason for people to attend events like, like Vision, of course, is for the networking opportunity. It's about making those connections. I know you had Ben on before, and he's absolutely right. It's not just about the weak links, it's the strong links, it's all the links. Because the people you meet here not only will become part of your extended network, which is crucially important, but they'll also give you advice, ideas, and maybe even and I say this to my audiences in my keynote speech, they maybe even become your unofficial sales team. Because your network, it's not just who you know, it's who knows you. It's much more important. I love that line, right? I love that it's, saying. It's so true too, yeah, isn't it? It's who knows you, knows what you do, knows how good you are at doing it. Because those people, if you have that connection, they'll pick up the phone and they will sell you to someone else if you ask them to. And there's nothing more valuable than that. So we were just in the city uh, last month. You're talking about Actually. New York City, no, I'm guessing? No, London. Oh, okay. New York City. Oh, city. right, the financial city. <laughs> okay. There are so many cities. Yeah. <laughs> and we were talking, uh, ironically, with some MIT professors yeah. uh, who wrote a book called The Second Machine Age, and we were in London, the home of the first machine age, which was you know, the steam engine, right? 
And the whole premise was that machines are, have always replaced humans. In many uh, ways. In physical labor. And yes. now they're starting to do it in cognitive labor. We hear about Watson, Watson Analytics, you know, Jeopardy, and so forth. Does that scare you? No, it, well, partially yes, partially no. It's interesting, there's been a plethora of recent uh, pronouncements by experts like uh, Professor Stephen Hawking and there was somebody Bill else Gates. as well, Bill Gates, basically warning us of the rise of the robots. The robots are coming and artificial intelligence, while amazing and while exciting and good, we as humans, they say, have to find a way to perhaps limit it just in case the whole war games thing happens or Terminator and they're redoing Terminator. So I'm partly talking sci-fi, I'm partly talking real world. I love the exponential growth of technology and what it can do for us. I mean, look at me, I've got my devices in front of me. These really in many ways dictate so much of my life and I love the help they give me. And I've never been a Luddite. If I see an advantage in technology, I'll grab it. Recently, I, I, made a, I issued a tweet about Uber. I'm loving Uber. I think it's a great leap of technology. I now know where the car is that I've booked. I know who's driving it. I know the license plate. And when I'm in it, other people can track me. I can track myself. I like that. But the sheer amount of hate that I got on Twitter from people who I'm just going to call Luddites, people who probably have an ax to grind, probably are involved in terms of their career and their living. And I get that. That's got to be painful when you can see the future. And the future is that technology is coming to take over. I got so much hate and it upset me because what are we going to do? Are we going to try and stop technology because we want to protect old jobs? No. Eventually, they're going to come up with the technology that outmodes a host or a moderator. And you know what? I'll be done then. And I'll be like, <laughs> fine. It is what it is. You're talking about protecting the past from the future. Well, that's right. And, you know, self-driving cars. People uh, are still laughing about it, but it's real. They are absolutely so much better than a human driver. In all the millions of miles worth of testing they've done, the only accidents, and there have been very few, the only accident has been caused by human intervention. There have been two, yeah, actually. No, there's 11 accidents and 1.7 million miles in the 20 plus accidents? Google cars. Okay. Right, all but the, the they were all rear-ended. They were yeah. rear-ended and they by rear-ended driver. Exactly, so yeah. um, the other day, Wall Street Journal put an article out and the headline was, um, robot drivers or uh, self-driving cars involved in more accidents. Ooh, that was a Wall Street <laughs> Journal. And I read it and I, and I actually tweeted, this is the most misleading headline of the day. And one of the Wall Street Journal's authors tweeted me back saying, well, it's a way to get attention. But no, because, I'm sorry to get all passionate about it because that is not the story. The story is they're safe. And I now, I think, would feel safer in a self-driving car, the one driven by my friends. Yeah. Because technology. But then there's that, Uber, that pesky Uber guy, though. So those things, yeah. things need to come that, together. Well, That's kind go. of the so well, thing maybe about Uber's Uber. coming to an end as well. well. It, but it's interesting <laughs> you say that because five years ago, nobody thought the self driving car was possible. No, they did not. And it's, it's, they're going to be d driving down Starro Drive soon. Right, exactly. Right? Well, well, they're they're, right. they're going to be replacing us on the queue. Well, then the yeah. bizarre thing is yeah. when it's just a download onto your Tesla, you don't even have to go get a new well, car. It's a software correct. update. It's just a software update. And computers are writing, they're replacing you know financial write-ups, right? When, yes, they are. The end sports sports write-ups are now write -ups. being written by robots. Okay, so, so but the, the biggest question is, are we afraid, are we worried? And I think no, because you could have asked me the same question if I was a loomist back in the 1800s running a loom with fabric, am I worried that you know automation's coming? I'd have probably said yes, because it affects my job. And I think we've got to draw the line between where a job is affected and where uh, we hold back our own development as humans. So what do... And by the way, I've seen Battlestar Galactica. I know what Cylons are, yeah. and there is obviously an well, issue. Well, I mean, out it's there. like all, all these things come true in the life. You know, they say everything on Star Trek will eventually come true. But That's right. What do humans do well that, that machines don't? What do you advise children? Like, what should you focus on? Well, I think what we have to do as humans, and this really is not my main area, but I think we have to harness what technology can give us and become better humans as a result. So I have three kids of differing ages, and that's exactly the message I will give to them. They've completely harnessed technology. I learn from them now. Apparently, Facebook is not as popular as it was. It's all Snapchat now. Who knew? I can't take Snapchat because you do a video, and then 30 seconds later, it disappears forever. That's why I like Periscope. The beauty of Periscope, exactly. Well, you've got 24 hours. At least you've got 24 hours before the Periscope video disappears. Right. Well, Twitter video is very exciting, don't you think? Yeah. Yes, and well, I, I've just really taken to Periscope because what I love about that is it allows you to build yet another connection. And this comes back to your question, what do humans do better? And I, the answer is communication. Periscope is one of those apps that allows you to build a new connection with people who you know or who know you. It gives them a little bit more of an insight. I have followers, friends who watch some of my Periscopes and they say to me, I, we feel like we're with you. 
we feel like we see a bit of your life. And that's a great way to extend connections. That's something you can't do with humans the whole time because you're on the road, you're not with them. And, and Facebook, to an extent, is like that. I know what my friends are up to, and I like that new human connection. So in a very long-winded way, to come around to your question, I think as humans, we're very good at communicating. We're very good at spotting opportunities. And what we should always strive to be good at is harnessing what's available to us to grow our own worlds, to grow us as people, and to grow our businesses, and to become more successful and to keep being happy. Well, Mark, an, an interesting thing on Periscope just came up, right? So we do a lot of stuff with sports. We, we spend time with uh, Bill Schlau at the Giants. They put in high-density Wi-Fi, great 4G, but now with Periscope, I can be my own sportscaster. I can yes, basically can. sit in my chair at the Giants, leverage this terrific infrastructure that they've given, well, film the game and talk about it. So, talk, you know, the impact on licensing and, and, and you know, kind of this decentralization. It's interesting because sports is still one of the few things that broadcasters can count on a large audience exactly. tuning in. Exactly, and you know in. what? They still can. Because despite all the fuss about the recent fight in Vegas, people had obviously paid HBO 100 and whatever it was bucks for the fight. They're holding their phone up, they're filming it, so their followers are now watching it. But you're watching a fight on a phone, okay? That's not the same experience. So I think that the likes of HBO just need to settle back and go, you know what, it's fine. We've still got our client base. It's not going to disappear. Yeah, I don't know. I do because I used to be in the TV business, and we said the same thing. Who's ever going to watch a big movie on a little screen? Boy, we were wrong. The kids never lift their their faces out of. Well, those John Cleese said right. that when he was on. John yeah. Cleese was on the Cube a few weeks ago, and he's like, "Why would anybody do that?" And I was like, "Well, I do that all the time." <laughs> and you know, it's a fantastic so do I. experience. But, but for a big live sporting event, when you're with your friends and you're having drinks, well, you're that's just different. not going to yeah. watch right. yeah. movies. It's a different. It's a different product altogether. Um, and also, the fact is, when someone's on Periscope, unless they're really careful and they've set it up on a tripod and they've lit it perfectly you've got a lot of wobble going on that's not the same experience but you're getting a little insight so Ellen DeGeneres every day now she does periscopes you get to see in the dressing rooms behind the scenes before right, the right. curtains open up that's fascinating to me I'll still watch her show on TV if I get a chance right because I've seen that doesn't mean I won't then watch the final product if anything I'm now more excited about what she does because I get that little bit of insight. What are some of the fun things that you've seen in your in your travels and your speaking? It's and you can mention other other companies. That's okay if, if you don't want to. That we understand no, too. We be respectful of them, but you know they know we're independent. So yeah. what are some of the fun things that you've seen and done? Um, well, a couple of things. I think you have to engage your audience always. I do a lot of sales kickoffs. So instead of, like at this fabulous event, we have our customers and clients here. Um, I do a lot of events where the actual team, the, the members of staff of an organization come together, one or 2,000 people. You've got to, again, the rules are the same. Give them something they can use. Give them something they can actually learn and develop and take away with them. But also some fun too. So I play a game with a lot of my audiences, which is just, it's very successful because it's based on pure maths. So it's called heads or tails, it's basics. And what you do is you have everyone in the room stand up. And I've done this for as many as 5,000 people in a single game. And you start, hi, I'm seeing people. Um, you start asking questions. Very, very large general knowledge questions for which there are two answer choices given and they're always numerical. So you might say, how many tube stops are there on the London Underground? Is it hands on heads, 312, or hands on your bottoms, tails, 313? Well, no one ever knows. It's impossible. It's like a red or black roulette gamble. Right, right. So of course the audience goes heads, tails, you lose half for every question. So with my 5,000 people audience, it took only seven questions to whittle it down to a single winner who we labeled smartest person in the room. <laughs> now it was fun, it was amusing, but it was refreshing. And when you're in an audience, you need those moments to reawaken you. And it, I tell a lot of my clients this, people will fall into a waking sleep within 15 minutes. So you have to keep pressing the reset button, whatever it can be. So when I see fun things yeah, like a heads or tails game, I love that. Uh, that to me is very exciting. I love seeing video used. I love the fact now that we can grab, whoops, grab an iPhone, shoot some interviews, rehash it on the iPhone and put it on a big screen within 10 minutes of actually doing it. I love the fact that people enjoy seeing themselves on the screen and again it's another refresh, it's another reset. On the other side, can I give you some of my top tips for travel? Because I travel the entire time. That's what the event business is, you know that right? Mm -hmm. Two top tips for travel. Number one, when you check into your hotel room, uh, like me, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always staying in different hotels and, and every week there could be three different hotels. I forget my room number. 
So the minute I leave, that's right, the minute I leave my hotel room, I go, I take a picture of the hotel room, and boom, I'm in. And number two, get yourselves TSA pre. If you're in the United States, it changes We have clear. Everything. We have clear. It's even better. Clear's Just good. Go. No, mm. clear's not even better, and I'll tell you why. Clear, you still have to take your computer out of your bag. That's right. Clear, sure. you still have to take your shoes off. With TSA pre, you don't have to take anything out of your bags. And, and the other tip there is don't wear a big belt buckle. <laughs> right, because it gets the metal detector going. And, and then you'll sail right through. And you never, here's my last tip, you never know who you're going to meet. I met someone quite by chance in Vegas once that led me to what has been now nine appearances on the Today Show on NBC. If I hadn't put myself out there, if I hadn't taken that little mini risk, and you, you never know. I, I don't think I ever would have been on that show. And being on that show has added to my overall impact on this business, without a doubt. Take out the headphones, smile. Mark Jeffries, thanks so much <laughs> for coming on theCUBE. I know you got to run. And and, and do your, your hosting thing, and really fantastic. Loved it this Thank morning. You. Great segment, thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you so much, I'll see you soon. All thanks. right, keep it right there, but we'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from IBM Vision 2015. Right back.